Good afternoon. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. I'm Sean Weaver with the Oak Ridge Church of Christ in Blackland, Mississippi. Thank you for tuning in. This is one of our last of our series on Wednesday nights, If I Only Had More. And tonight we're going to be dealing with If I Only Had More Peace in My Life. We want to go ahead and invite you to come and be a part of our very special day, our Friends and Family Day. It's our kickoff of our regular schedule that's coming up in a couple of weeks. It begins at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Sunday, I believe that's March the 28th, so make sure you mark your calendars, be praying for it, and come out and be a part of that. We're going to have a very special day. Uh, we're going to have a, a worship service together, as well as have a lunch together and in a period of singing, and then an afternoon uh, worship service again about uh, 1.32 o'clock. So we're looking forward to having you there with us. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting everything started. We took an opportunity to talk about our classes this past Sunday after worship. And uh, we're really excited about getting everything going there. So without further ado, I'm going to move this thing over to where you can see the screen. And we'll go through our lesson together. Thanks and have a great afternoon. And we uh, hope you have a great rest of the week. Love you guys. Series, if I only had more... And I thought I'd end on one that to me is a, is a really important one too. If I only had more peace, and I'm going to go ahead and finish that, if I had only had more peace in my life. Our scripture tonight comes specifically from John 14 and verse 27, but as we'll see, there's other ones I want us to consider. Let's begin with reading John 14 verse 27 together. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Another one that talks a lot about peace is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's so many thoughts uh, that come to mind when I think about the word peace. Uh, maybe it's uh, something that crosses your mind, like uh, you know, laying out on your back and, and watching the stars uh, in a cool evening, a cool summer day. Uh, the temperature's just right, or maybe your piece is out on the lake fishing, or maybe it's a trip to the mountains, or, or an uncrowded beach, or maybe it's just a, a little time uh, with yourself, maybe with a book, or, or just enjoying the, the peace and quiet. That peace, that peace may be a quiet time with your spouse after the kids have gone to bed. It might be the quiet times together in front of a campfire. You know, here's the thing. Sometimes life itself seems to be the enemy of peace. Uh, peace is a, a beautiful thought. It's, it's a great word. It, it, at no time does the word peace give us trouble, give us stress, give us fear. The word itself almost seems to set, take on some kind of a medicinal quality. This is a desire, I believe, of all humanity. Whether it's Christian or non-Christian alike, we want peace. We want rest from, from wars and conflicts. We want rest from arguments and, and, and fighting amongst ourselves. We want to be free. We want to be free from worry. We want to be free from cares. We want to be free from concerns. We don't want our consciousness beating us uh, or, or the guilt disturbing us. And most importantly, I think as Christians, we want real and tangible peace between us and God. I think this, this is what's behind the whole concept of the forgiveness of sins. We understand that when the blood of Christ washes our sins away, God remembers them no more. And, and now he can look at us and see his son and be at peace with us and us with him. We all certainly want peace, but perhaps we need to be reminded of just what is necessary 
I think, to maintain that peace in our lives. So that's what we're going to think about today. Um, I've given us four points to concentrate on for this lesson. If I only had more peace. And considering what the Bible says about peace and how to obtain it, the first one I want us to consider is this one. Those who continue in doing what's right in the sight of God, and we call that righteousness, maintain the blessings of peace with God. Romans chapter 2, verse 7, beginning, To them who are by patient continuance and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them who are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doth evil, of the Jew first and also so of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Jesus came to bring a message to the lost, to break down the barrier between man and God. This was his mission. And that mission is still real and it still lives on through to those who claim to be his own. Not, not only do we experience the peace with God, when we become a Christian, we also become vessels of peace, or at least we should be vessels of peace to others. The working of good mentioned here in this passage is the sowing of the word of reconciliation and peace. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The ones who make peace happen in this world are those who work to reconcile God to every man through the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the turmoil for, of this world and our, and our realization of the relationship between us and God and others in God, I think helps build a desire for peace and a yearning for peace. So number one, those who continue to do right in the sight of God maintain the blessing of peace. Here's number two. Peace can be ours if we strive to understand and live by the words which Christ has left us. If we strive to understand and live by the words that Christ has left us. John chapter 14, verse 24, begin. And he that loveth me, uh, he that loveth me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who my Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, of course, we understand that Jesus is talking. He's talking to those who are there in his presence of, uh, about what's fixing to happen on that day of Pentecost. But now this this saying is true here for all of us. If you keep not my sayings, the, the, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father sent them. And, and, and in keeping those words, in keeping those words, you keep and have that peace. Even though these first glance, it may seem to cause a great deal of conflict, this conflict's it only exists in the struggle between the will of God and the will of man or, or the devil. Real peace comes when embracing God's word. It comes with embracing the way of Christ and rejecting our own ideas and solutions about things. I, the conflict and struggle, I think, comes when men resist, when they argue with, and when they, in one way or another, they try to fight against the word of God or the word of Christ, as Jesus talks about in John 14. You know, man's reasoning and his philosophy, it'll attempt to produce a peace 
but it's not a lasting peace. It's really not a real peace. We'll never really be happy and at peace when that so-called peace is really comes from any source other than God and his living word. So peace can be ours if we'll strive to live by the words which God has given us. You know, someone once said that even if you didn't want to use God's word to, to make you a Christian, it still makes you better. It'll make you a better husband, a better wife, a, a better son or daughter, a better parent. It'll make you a better employer or employee. It'll make you a better person. So again, those words can help bring peace to us. It kind of brings us to, to the next point here. To be spiritually minded is peace. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 beginning. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the spirit, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they are not, they are them that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When our minds wander out into the world for, for our peace, if that's what drives our security, if that's what drives our happiness, our, our peace of mind, we're not going to get those things that will help us for very long. We may receive what we believe is peace for the moment, but it will not be long-lasting. Only when we can take a, a hold of where our thoughts and, and and focus them on the beautiful things that God has in store for us. Only then can we truly have that peace of mind that passes all understanding. Our hope, our, our peace is founded upon those things that can't be shaken or moved or changed in any way. It's true, just like the song says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And if I start putting all of my stock, if I put start putting all of my thoughts and all of my ambitions just wrapped up in this, this thing here, and, and that's all I'm thinking about, well, I'm never really going to have that peace that I really need, that peace that passes all understanding. And lastly, and I think perhaps most important, the cross of Jesus Christ brings us real and everlasting peace. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, For he, talking about Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself and himself of twain a new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both to God and one body at the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and became and preached peace unto you which were far off, and to them that were near. We need to remember that without Jesus Christ and without the, that sacrifice that he gave, there would never be peace between God and man, and therefore there would never be any reconciliation. There would never be any salvation. We enjoy our relationship with God only because and through the cross of Christ. Galatians, uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, and by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sights. 
What he's saying here is in our sins and because of our sins, we were enemies of God. God's wrath was, was ready to be poured out on us. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, uh, 20, uh, 6 and verse 23, right? The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. God's wrath was poised to be poured out on us. We may, we need, you know, we may consider this lightly, but we need to really understand that we don't want to be on the wrong side of God's wrath. Hebrew writer in Hebrews 10 verse 26 beginning says that if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. It was the cross of Christ that saved us from that wrath that, that we deserve. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna keep that wrath uh, aside, then we need to continually walk in that path as best we can. So what can we conclude from, from our study? I think you know, the first one is this one, that real and lasting peace uh, cannot come from the physical elements of this world. Our jobs, our, our fame, our health, our investments, all are, they're just just a part of constantly changing world. I was looking at something the other day considering how much the, the dollar has devalued through time. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just one of those things that just changes, isn't it? I remember just how wonderful it was to have that vehicle that I first bought. Well, you know, 200,000 miles later that I've put on it, it's not as, it's not as uh, you know, it's fine but it's not new anymore. You know, that house is beautiful that when you buy it, but that first house payment kind of starts wearing that new off. So here, here's what I'm saying. All of these things are part of a constantly changing world. And I think that we need to be reminded that, that those things are just that. They are, are, are things that are changing, that are fleeting, that are dissolving, uh, you know, burning up, rusting out, falling in, but the peace that passes all understanding, the hope that we have through Christ, well, that's lasting peace. That's peace that's not going to change as long as we don't change for the negative. By, the second one is this. God wants us to have a real and lasting peace. He wants us to have a real and lasting peace. Jesus came and died on the cross that we might be able to obtain that peace. And, and God offers that peace through, the, through, the, the, through Christ. He offers that peace through his Holy Spirit. But the question I think we need to ask ourselves is can we truly say that we have that peace that passes all understanding. It is a real and working part of us. Well, I think if, you know, if we said, and I have uh, at the beginning of this thought, if I just had more peace, maybe I hadn't been looking at the right way, at the right place for that peace. If we truly are at peace, our mind or conscience won't condemn us. However, it can only come through Christ. A, a Christian needs to turn from the pursuit and the distractions of things that really doesn't give us uh, a peace that passes understanding. We need to be focusing more on those things that last. And then consideration goes to those who haven't given uh, Christ their heart through obedience. You need that peace. You need that peace that only comes through obedience to the gospel through turning your heart over to Christ and, and obeying his word and, and being counted among those who are, who are Christians. So that's our lesson for this afternoon. And uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the week. Let us pray together. 